I'll give you a little bit of an introduction to why we are having this event. Why I got so interested in the film you're about to see and the person who made it. Why when I spoke with Nancy Davenport, she got equally excited about the prospects of being able to share this film and filmmaker with the campus. Then if our speaker hasn't arrived by the time I stop talking and I will not talk long, we will view the video. And then we will meet its maker. <laughs> well, if luck, she will have arrived by the time the video is done. Early last summer, I got an email from a listserv that I was on talking about a film I hadn't heard about. It was called Out of Print. Hmm. And it was being shown at the Tribeca Film Festival in New York, and I knew that was a pretty nice film festival. So I clicked through and I saw what else I could learn. And then by sort of following my way, as we do on the web, I found that it's the documentary filmmaker Vivian Romani was going to be in Washington. And she was going to be showing her film at an event of an organization of educators in Washington. So not being shy, I tracked her down. <laughs> and I asked, could I come see the film? Because as some of you may know, uh, my research for the last number of years has particularly focused on the way we read on screens. I see one of my students nodding. Uh, as opposed to the ways we read in print. Hmm. I'll bet that this was a person with whom I had kindred feelings. And Vivian very graciously said, of course. The film was supposed to, view, what, to go on at 10 o'clock at night. It was the end entertainment for this group. So I went down to the Hilton at, on 16th Street Mercifully, Vivian was there with nothing to do in particular until the video went on, and we chatted as if we had known each other for years about the things that we knew are, were our shared interests. So please make yourself comfortable. So uh, then their DVD player didn't work, and it went on and on and on, and finally close to midnight, we got to see the video. It was worth staying for. So I'm delighted that uh, given her incredibly busy schedule, that Vivian, once she gets here, <laughs> is going to be here to share why she was interested in making the video she made. I'll tell you the smallest smidge about her background. She has made two that I know of, really wonderful documentary films. This is the second of them. She's had many years of experience as a librarian. How many librarians are in the room? Okay, more kindred spirits, right? Uh, and she's very much not just in love with books, but concerned about what their future is. I will say no more. You will see some people you recognize. You will hear some voices you recognize. I will just tell you that I went to see, um, oh, I'm not gonna remember the name of the county. Uh, yes, uh, August Osage County. You will hear a voice. When I was watching the movie, I said, it's the same voice. You'll know what I mean when you start watching. Thank you. Anyway, it's just really a pleasure to be with you. Um, it was touch and go with the s weather conditions, but um, uh, here I am. And uh, so why did I make this film? Um, I don't know if, if you got a chance to see a little bit of my background, but I was involved in a few major research libraries. And I was involved with digitization projects. I thought it was very exciting. It's great, you know, uh, at the Library of Congress, at Hopkins, uh, and at UC Berkeley. But then one night, a couple of students said to me when they asked about their research projects, and I showed them the print information and the online information, and they said, do, I, do we have to use the print also for our research? I said, yeah, if you want a good research project. They said, never mind, we'll change our research topic. And I started thinking about that, and what does it really mean? I never thought that one would replace the other. I always thought they would work together. Um, and then I left libraries. Um, then I noticed that uh, there were a lot of articles coming out, the book, uh, you know, 
One of my favorites was Web 2 Book Drop Dead. And I started pondering about wh what are this, th this character book has been a very important character in our lives. We love it, we hate it, we m it makes us cry, it makes us angry, and there's always been, it's always been persecuted. You know, there was, so I started thinking of a film, an animated film, <coughs> with, um, you know, censorship, personified, animated censorship uh, going after the book, fire, um, ignorance, decay, but then it was really like sitting on top of a quiet volcano that just erupted. And th there were so many changes and so many things going on daily. Um, and this is how it came about. So I'd like to open it for questions. Uh, yes. Experts in the field. Yeah, I'm curious. Yes. How you introduced yourself, how did you find Bezos, uh, the journalists, how well you did it? Well, it's very interesting. You can all hear me, right? Great. Now I can raise it a little bit. Well, it was very interesting. Uh, some of them were so willing to help. I just actually emailed Tubin. I emailed him, cold turkey. And he said, sure. And I ran into him on the subway that morning. And I said, oh, I'm the one who's going to be interviewing soon. Thank you so much. He said, I'm glad to help a fellow artist. It was that simple. Bezos, you know, of course, make a long story short, if you have a direct contact to anyone, they usually say yes. It's only when you have to go through their gatekeepers that they always say no. <laughs> So through publisher friends, through, and as my, <laughs> with Meryl Streep, uh, that was a really late acquisition. Uh, my uh, um, music, he, he was incredible. He's, there he is, Alexander Lass, uh, he's done some very serious films and he kindly donated the music <laughs> for this film, which was amazing and it's all original. Um, when uh, I was reviewing it with him, he, s I, he said, so wh wh what's your ideal now to finish the film? I said, Meryl Streep would be nice, but I think I'm giving up on her. I got another one who was, you would recognize the name, but it wasn't <laughs> Meryl. And he said, oh, come on. It's, we, know, we know you always know somebody who knows somebody, so just think about it. <laughs> so he gave me the incentive. And periodically, you really need incentive to do any part of this type of project. Somebody, yes? When you started this project, did you know what the outcome would be? Did you know what the final messages would be that would culminate in the last act, if you will? Well, I think this will answer your question. Uh, the first cut of this film was called Precipice. So um, I approach films, a, as most people, with a real tabula rasa. You know, and, and actually, one of the difficulties with this one is every few minutes, I'd say to myself, you were born holding these gadgets. Now what? You know, and, and the other side, I have a husband in the house who was walking around muttering, it's the end of civilization. It's just the end of civilization. And I'd ask questions. Well, didn't you just look for directions? Oh, well, it's good for that, okay. Didn't you just download a couple of books? B only because I'm traveling, okay. <laughs> so, so slowly we came. Uh, so it evolved, and I evolved, and he evolved. <laughs> So, um, yeah, it has to change at least three or four times before you've got a film. <laughs> yeah. I have a question for you that I'm very curious to hear from audience members as well as the education question that flows out of your work. Um, I am here out of the trenches of 12 years being a high school English teacher, literature teacher, 
So I lived through the decline of students being able to read long books, changing to short books, the decline of teenagers being able to concentrate in any sustained way, the radical growth of essay mills and spark notes. Uh, my highly intelligent daughter got into an excellent university. I think she read one book by Willa Cather in high school, and that was it. And my own research, which oh, tells me in any case only 7% today of graduate or English majors anyway. So I. And when you're talking. the time age upon which we should be developing critical thinking and literary literacy schools skills in our adolescence because it is has tremendous cultural relevance and I tingle with it constantly would love to hear those of you who do and are not does the field want to go first I have I I have a lot of <laughs> answers for that. Yes, it is. So, but would you? One literature can give is share a story. The teacher learn oh it is still a um, two comes in, in a film or in the oral presentation reading out loud content that allows that learning to happen Yes, I completely agree with you. I'm sorry, there's another one. Yeah. yeah I, I, it was interesting that Vsauce was saying he learned more from fiction than nonfiction. And, uh, you know, it's, it's the, the, the one of the dictums in writing is show, don't tell. And I think as opposed to telling somebody, letting them discover it in fiction is much more powerful. Yeah, um, I agree. Uh, we should not give up on uh, literature. <laughs> I mean, it has been proven over and over again that reading fiction, reading Beckett, reading a story, a full story, not bits and pieces, um, is uh, very indicative of the success of a labor force and of the economic well-being of a country, period. Now, remember, a long time ago, it, uh, stories used to be performed. Stories were heard on, on gadgets. Uh, so I think we do have to present the classics as well as other literatures in various formats so that um, they get the critical thinking, they get the ideas, they get to understand what was being transmitted throughout the ages that really we do not want to lose. I'm sorry, you had some. I didn't want to interrupt you. I <laughs> um, I'd like to follow up with what you said, conjunct with what's been brought up. <coughs> Robert McKee is, for those of you that don't know, wrote a brilliant book called Story. He is the guru in Hollywood about the key role of story in civilization and that in every form we look for story whether it's a great news story whether it's a great novel whether it's a classic Greek play I taught literature in high school for 11 years I teach here at the SOC 
I teach screenwriting. I've written 11 screenplays that were free were option, and I write novels. But at the core of that, what I find when you're dealing with students is that students are fascinated with all the internet, Twitter, everything, when you talk about story. Basic elements of a character arcing, of a character, a person learning something, influencing other people, antagonists, basic elements of a good story, they're wrapped with attention. Because that's in our nature. That's in life. And when you, so your comment about literature, I think is at the core of story. And uh, obviously I'm biased because I'm <laughs> also in literature, but story is critical. Yeah, yeah. Actually, I, I actually um, interviewed a professor at Princeton who was doing uh, studies. I don't know how many of you know the moth. He got his inspiration from being at the moth ones. And somebody got up and told a story, and he saw the reaction of the audience, and he thought, this is amazing. What's going on here? So he decided to actually for d d d do his entire project on how does the body respond, how does the brain respond to a story. And he took a story, and he cut it apart and turned it upside down and inside out, and he had people listen. And what was fascinating, he never made it uh, in the film, what was fascinating in his findings at the time, and he was still continuing, reading was the next phase, this was listening, he said that, uh, this rarely happens in science apparently, that all the, 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 the brain lit in e everywhere, not only for the same person every single time he heard the full story or she, but even with other people, the same brain lights. So apparently this is quite phenomenon, phenomenal, yeah. Between people and within yourself over and over again, it's the same thing. So, so the power of a story is important. And I have an anecdote that will illustrate that. Um, I know a young man who, who now is a chef, but when he was a young teenager, was very much ADA. And he was the son of a librarian and a college literature professor. And it was about the time that Harry Potter was coming out. And I was visiting, and he had one of the books in his hand. And he said, oh, how do you like this one? And he said, I won't know until I've read it two more times. Oh. And, and, and I said, why two more times? And he said, well, the first time I read it is to get the basic storyline. The second time is to find out who the characters are and how they interact with each other. And the third time is to read it for flavor text. His word, I said, what does that mean? He said, it means things like, she ran quickly, he whispered, a and it, adverbs, adjectives, it's what brings the story to life. And he said, after I know those things, then I can read the books for pleasure. Uh, and I thought this was one of the most astute young men I had ever met for, the, for, the, for being willing to do it but it was the power of a story. He said, I have to read Harry Potter because every book is written. Well, it, it's very interesting what you said because um, that's brilliant. But with all this transitional times that we're going through, I'm actually less concerned about the very smart kids. It doesn't matter if they have gadgets 24 seven, they know when to stop themselves. They know the very, very, very top. Then you've got the very um, um, challenged kids, either physically, economically, or whatever. The computer, the internet, can give them so much information that they could never have. You could, that's why I put that Indian project there. It's amazing what they could learn. You know, they stumble into math, geography, I mean, everything. It's fantastic. It's everyone in between those two ends that really concern me. And I've seen it firsthand over and over again. Um, I'm completely uh, um, for the advantages that this tool gives us. There are tremendous disadvantages, but we're in it. There's nothing we can do. It always surprises me that we're such obedient consumers, uh, even 
when kids tell me I'd rather read a book, the schools, the libraries, the publishers, more and more are going into just digital. Um, but unfortunately, it's always come down on parents and teachers. I think now it's even tougher on parents and teachers. And it's very difficult on parents because parents themselves, and <laughs> I was caught doing that the other day, it's like, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, what did you say? You know, and how can we ask them not to do that when we are really so involved? You know, we can't put it down. Th there have been a lot of, I, I think we are in a transitional period, and I think we'll figure it all out because we humans do. You know, I don't know if you um, know um, John Perry Barlow. He was a lyricist for the Grateful Dead. And he put it very well. Uh, he said a friend of his accused him of being a pronoid. What is a pronoid? Is someone who has a pathological belief that uh, the universe is on our behalf. And, and I actually uh, believe that, that we will figure it out because we have a need to survive and to figure it out. But I think, um, and different parents are trying different things like when you walk into the house, there's a bowl. You just put your gadgets in the bowl, and you don't see them again until a certain hour in the evening when everything is done and only for half an hour. I think these kinds of limitations are very important for something like this. And I've seen it firsthand. I've seen it firsthand. I've seen parents, very devoted parents, who initially thought, said, no, my kid is fine. They, they can do, you know, they know how to limit themselves and all that. And then eventually... When I visited again, there were complete limitations. And I said, uh, what happened from last time? They said, we've noticed that their um, schoolwork went down, their, their grades went down, and they didn't get along as well with each other. And now, they, uh, and, and now the limit is that uh, computers and gadgets and games and all that, welcome to use them on the weekends, on holidays, but that's it. suggest a tale of three perspectives, which you beautifully illustrated uh, in, in your film. One is the perspective of Scott Turow that says, if you want people to write, you have to make it possible for them to eat. Another is the perspective of Robert Darnton, the librarian at Harvard, who says, you need to make things available to people, and hence he engineered uh, the Digital Public Library of America, which launched on the 18th of April, 1975, hardly a man is now alive. It, it launched when Paul Re on, on the day when Paul Revere um, went on his famous ride saying the British are coming. Um, so it launched last April. And if I'm understanding correctly, because I haven't known all the dimensions of it, he's looking for anything that a library owns that's digitized to be available, including things under copyright. But I may be wrong on that. And then you have John Perry Barlow, who in addition to his interesting activities with the Grateful Dead, um, I believe, someone correct me if I'm wrong, is the man who said information wants to be free and runs an inter you know, electronic freedom foundation and so forth, and really says, you may not get money out of this, but you'll get knowledge and you'll get exposure and all those other good things, which doesn't answer Scott Turow's question of how you're supposed to eat. Put these three people in the same room. You did beautifully with them individually. Put them in the same room, and how would we come to some kind of agreement? They'll kill each other. No. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. I couldn't help that. Um, these are really uh, important issues today, as you said so beautifully. And remember, even with all the restrictions, that was true pirating what we were doing. That was live. We actually were searching for Scott Turow's books and downloaded them. We just didn't finish. We stopped before they fully downloaded. Uh, and also with, and it was that simple, really. It's like, okay, let's get the <coughs> camera rolling while we do the search. Oh, there it is. <coughs> So, and you saw that, what was it, 
uh, 45% admitted to, well, 30% admitted and 15% would rather not answer. So as far as I'm concerned, 45% admitted to uh, pirating books. So it is, it is an issue. Um, it's not clear right now what the answer is. Um, th there's been talk about uh, um, a subscription model for books. Uh, there's been talk about, um, well, there's a lot of self-publishing out there. Um, what was interesting to me is that the very, I'm up on the statistics, so not much actually has changed. And uh, the statistics that I read recently, the set of statistics said, they gave, uh, they asked writers eight reasons why they write. To make money was the fifth down, which was very interesting to me. So why are people, why are writers writing? Now, when I talk to writers independently, uh, they, they are concerned. They say they don't think they can make a living anymore writing. So I'm not, I don't have the answer, but we will see answers develop in the next five to 10 years. We have to. They're, st they're still debating back and forth. And Darcy Chan has successfully um, uh, pr uh, uh, published a book the traditional way, and she's commissioned to publish a third one. And she much prefers the traditional way. Um, and as far as making money self-publishing, Right now, it's not that great. In the future, I think it's a battle between the ability to make money, uh, but also everybody's going to publish a book. I mean, uh, I'm exaggerating, obviously, but there are so many books out there. I mean, you saw, and it's getting worse. Everybody, I mean, I belong to a lot of these lists, and hey, I'll pull a self-publishing book. What, what they're really um, looking for is what's the right software? Do you need a cover? You know, th th they're technical issues, not whether or not I should publish a book. Remember when publishing a book meant it you better have something really, really good to say? Ah, uh, thank you. Um, I have an eight-month-old daughter who's, um, I'm slowly selling off pieces of my library as her possessions grow. <laughs> <laughs> so I've been thinking very carefully, I'm being a bibliophile, about <laughs> the relationship between what books and child rearing in my house. But uh, mm -hmm. two quick comments. Um, one is that I'm a historian and you know, pr we like to think progress is linear, but it isn't. There, there are gaps, there are reverses, there are dark ages and that's gonna happen. We're gonna lose information even as we collect it and it's unfortunate and all we can do is try to limit the loss, I think. Um, but while we're being flooded with all this new information, I'm thinking about how we find what we're looking for and uh, I have a bad habit of reading readers' comments on the Washington Post and people can't discern the difference between a news story, a feature article, an editorial, and they're always angry at the writer. They're always spewing this stuff about, you didn't put in what I wanted to read about. Or, and if we're talking as educators or parents about you know, how to help our children, whether they read you know, a book or a computer or some new format we don't know, the ability to teach them how to discern what they're looking for, what they're reading, what it is, what the quality of it is, I think is gonna be important because, you know, the good stuff will survive, in the large part, if it's good, if it's good enough, if it's needed. But and we'll have people, we'll develop, you know, new librarians will help us get to those places. But if they don't know what they're looking for, if they don't know what to ask for, it's going to be really difficult to to get at the information just because there's so much out there. It'll just be lost in the noise. Yes. Um. You know, I like Code Academy. I don't know if you know, there's a Code Academy online, uh, free. 
it teaches not eight months old, older kids, how you create code. And what I like about that is that it's important to know how the computer contains information. The input is fallible. Ask for, it's going to be really difficult to, to get at the information just because there's so much out there. It'll just be lost in the noise. Yes. Um, you know, I like Code Academy. I don't know if you know, there's a Code Academy online. Uh, free. It teaches, not eight months old, older kids, how you create code. And what I like about that is that it's important to know how the computer contains information. The input is fallible. And that is a lesson that we teachers and parents have to teach their children from the get-go. It's like I used to, well, never mind that. The other, the other thing you hit on is extremely important. Um, how do you uh, decipher um, uh, what is relevant and good information and what isn't? Again, parents and teachers, we have to be very critical. You know, I remember saying to the kids, look, that's a commercial that you're watching. They're just, it's not true. They want you to spend your money and to buy the Coke. It's not good for you. It look at the studies. It rots your teeth. It rots a nail. So that's the study. You know. So it's just to make. Do you want to spend your money on something like that? Then they won. You know. They got you. So I think we have to be even more vigilant about that. We have to tell them what's uh, good information, what isn't. We have to show them how you f have to find, like we did with print, the resource, the the source the original source, you know, who is saying this. But you also <laughs> unintentionally really depressed me because <laughs> I, I agree with you. I mean, s I tell my husband, I went from being totally mediocre to being super, super, super smart by changing nothing. I didn't do anything. It's what's around me, the, the people who are... I asked a, a very smart young woman uh, a few months ago, I wish we had more investigative reporting. I really miss that. And she retorted with, I read five articles in the New York Times today, and they were all good. I didn't know how to respond without offending. So I, s I ended up saying something pretty stupid. I said, well, what is your definition of investigative reporting? And everybody around me, what? What? <laughs> you know, you really... But she was talking about she read five good stories, five good reports. Okay, that's not the same. You know, so um, I think our uh, task is huge. And I worry also because the teachers are being, ha are being trained by people who are being raised in all this. So our... our uh, teacher colleges have to be even more aware of what's going on and how to teach the teachers. My son makes commercials. <laughs> 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 they're not true. <laughs> and they're absolutely <laughs> true. <laughs> I, and I loved your movie. You touch on a lot Thank of different you. points, but there are there are two very different issues, the, the commercial issue, which is important, but not nearly as important as the issue of learning. And, you know, we've gone from the clay tablet to the electronic tablet, and as one of the teachers said, they're just a tool. We have to distinguish between the, the container and the content. And um, I happen to have a 15-year-old grandson living me with me at the moment, and it is shocking for me to understand or to try to understand how he how he thinks and how what he does when he comes home and what they're doing at school, it is so different, and not necessarily worse. Maybe a lot better than when I was in school for sure. And they have access to so much information. I mean, before Gutenberg, we didn't have much information. We opened it up, and now we're opening it up even more. And so I think uh, it seems to me that the the challenge is to to understand how to use these new tools effectively. 
the thing that will keep the book going is the fact that it doesn't need a power source or a playback device. Um, I, I, I think it's great what your grandson is doing. Uh, and it's true, there are some things that are, uh, they're learning, they know a lot more than we d do. They also know how to edit a film. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> in seconds, things that takes us a long time and a lot of money. Um, they don't always know how to tell a good story when they're editing. Um, but yeah, I, I think the biggest challenge is to navigate with dexterity the, this, this, uh, this uh, um, moving from print to, to digital. It's here, it's here. But we have to be very knowledgeable and we have to be very involved, at least until we get it all right. Um, and we will change, we have changed. In fact, that's what fascinated me about making the film. It's amazing how quickly our entire society has changed, the entire American landscape and now international, and we have changed. The way we read, the way we do things, um, yeah. It seems like as we're talking about how it's a difference between learning how to use them as tools, we also have to overcome prejudice because I'm the one who goes th to the library and prints everything out. And my friends are like, how come you didn't just read it online? What's wrong with you? And I'm like, I also read for fun too. I'm sorry about that as well. So how do we, in learning how to use them better as tools, how do we come, how do we get across this divide between your either camp technology or camp book? That's a very good question. Um, <laughs> You can imagine the prejudice. I s used computers since 1982, and I was and I used a handspring trio 20 years ago, and that was touch touch screen, and it was like it was the best tool. I al always threaten to write an article comparing because I still have two of them: the handspring trio to the iPhone, and showing you how it was a superior gadget. You know, because you had both. Okay, we didn't have apps, but that's something that you do outside the film. So the prejudice that I get, which is another end, is, oh, you're over 30. There's no way you know any of this. Let me explain it to you. In fact, when I went to Apple a few times, <laughs> or even called them, the Apple store, when I only used it twice, but when I was patronized, I got so upset. I finally looked at one of them in the eye and I said, um, uh, you know, I've really been using these things since before you were born. So, and it's the truth, you know. So, <laughs> no exaggeration. So, I understand your prejudice. Uh, th you're, you're facing these kind of prejudice. But I, I would just say to people, oh, I like both, you know. Oh yeah, I love it that way. And and I go <laughs> I go overboard. I kind of show them, hey, look what I just found. Did you try that one? And then I realize, oh, you're being so apologetic. Stop, <laughs> you know. But but it is a way of telling them uh, that we do both. You know, just they live side by side. There's a movie uh, for you with Ke uh, Keanu Reeves. He did it. It's a documentary how film has split, and he called the film side by side, so you can quote. Keanu Reeves and say, hey, he, he does film side by side. I can do paper uh, information side by side. Maybe, maybe. But spark notes, spark notes, much more likely. Moving more on to Sam Sieg, uh, I read a huge research report lately that said 80% of teens or college students sleep with their iPhone on their pillow. Yeah, they do. I mean, Those solitude. So the solitude can, is really not tolerated by these people. So if you can't be alone, you can't concentrate, how's that long book going to get read? And where's the 
let's get down and dirty right now. Okay, let me, gonna happen? <laughs> let me <laughs> let me let me let me answer you about that. The kids that I interviewed there went to the best high schools. No, they were not. You would I wanted to believe they were stupid, but they're not. <laughs> No, they go. They went to Bronx Science. <laughs> <laughs> they went to to really. To, uh, I forgot the other. Stuyvesant. Uh, the the college students, Brown. Uh, I'm t I'm telling you, these are the top. Whatever you call them, stupid. They may be stupid. They may not be stupid. But the fact, no, it's not you. Uh, you know, the fact <laughs> is, <laughs> somebody who really understands them. No, no. The point is, you know, it. They went to the best schools. And the optimism comes that <sighs> some of those have started, when they moved on further in high school, understanding the competition that existed out there and they had to get into college, the college students knowing that good writing skills were important in the uh, job force, the labor force, they started doing a lot more of that, of the reading and then the focusing on the concentration. Um, Yes, the attention span is the worst. Be worst. People talk to me about, oh, come on, it's no different than TV, like the MTV guy. Yes, it is. It is with you, morning, noon, and night. It's as if you carried your TV lightly all over town. And worst of all, you also interact with it whenever you want. So not a positive interaction, not Dora the Explorer. You know, it's... it's, it's um, and uh, I'm very close to uh, kids, and I definitely saw a downward turn from uh, starting at about age uh, 11, maybe a little before 11, like 10 and a half. Um, it, it's tough from 10 and a half, 11 till about 15 or so, 16. It's very tough. Uh, you know, uh, one of the things, besides the parents and teachers, one of the reasons I have a little optimism is there are people trying to figure this out. For example, algorithms, from another point of view, not the children. I hate algorithms. I love them. I hate them. Why? Yes, it's fun if you can really tell me what other books I would like, like this one. But you're, you're not expanding my brain. You know, you're making me just go into, you know, what I like to think. What happened to challenging me, to finding uh, d different points of view that, that I don't want to read because it's different, you know. Uh, so, but um, there's a man who actually was involved, a, a young man who actually was involved in uh, building the Kindle. And he created something different. He created a software now, he's testing it, where it actually reads the entire book, the software. And it analyzes this, I it based on syntax, uh, words, um, the way it's written. I it's a deep analysis. It's an analysis of a book and then tells you this is what this, how this book is done and instead of the algorithm, uh, algorithms. So you could see they're, they're trying to understand this. My, my fear is what happens when all the people who know and understand and appreciate all this yeah. are gone, <laughs> you know. Uh, but uh, that's not going to happen because, you know, that's not how uh, the humans evolve. Now, saying that it's only a tool, and, you know, I still believe it and I insi insist on it. I was, uh, I was on a southern tour. And and one of the people in the audience who actually owns a small bookstore, he said, it is the tool. And he said, I just did a search. I could have sworn he said a title of Shakespeare. And he said it took him till the third or fourth page to see that the or original author was Shakespeare. And uh, we know that our kids do not wait for the second and third page. If it's not on the first page, it just doesn't exist. So that was a bit frightening. I tested it with others, uh, other titles after that because I didn't remember the title he picked, and I didn't find that to be, but it's plausible. Let me just add one more small ray of hope, um, and you will because you have read about it. Um, if you actually ask 
college-age students, individually, rather than the group, because there's a lot of posturing that goes on. I mean, adults groups, you know, I don't mean adults in a bad sense, 30-year-olds, 40-year-olds, 70-year-olds. When we get together, we often want to seem that we're fitting in, right? But if you ask individually, 18 to 24, 26-year-olds, because I've done this in the United States here at ODU, I've done it in Germany, I've done it in Japan, they will tell you the following kinds of things. First, that if they are reading on their phone, if they're reading on a tablet, if they're reading on a computer, they get distracted. They can't concentrate. They're aware of it. If you say, if the book costs the same in hard copy as it does electronically, which would you prefer? And they'll tell you they want the print copy. Yep. So part of what we're seeing, I don't think, is an inevitability just because we see certain kinds of behavior patterns, particularly in groups. I, you know, I, was, I was fascinated by the, the women that you had together, the coffee plats, as it were, um, when um, one of the women said, this is where it's going. And another one said, what can you do? Well, there are things you can do of, of the sort that you've described. But it's also a lot of the people themselves who don't necessarily believe what the group seems to believe. And the group may not actually believe it. It's what they feel they're supposed to do. So I see a little inroad there. Yes, I, I asked even the 9 and 11-year-olds, uh, what, what do you prefer really? And they said definitely the print book. It's less distracting. And by the way, uh, Jane Friedman, I, I, had, I saw her recently. And uh, she said she, they do not uh, upload to, to the tablet. It's too distracting. She likes the Kindle. And especially, first of all, I told her, well, the Kindle, you can still do all that. Yeah, but it's not as much fun. Nobody, nobody really picks a Kindle <coughs> to do the multimedia. They do, or the multiple. The, the Kindle usually they pick because they want to read books. Well, I, I have, that's right, exactly. I agree, I agree. Um, n yeah, now uh, I have a nine year old granddaughter who's, <laughs> she, she really baffles me because the first five years I could not interest her in a book. And I used to read books to everybody at that age. She, and I thought, okay, here's one who we lost. She's nine years old. She reads this thick, and she's totally engrossed. And she told me the other day, she said, I could read it in a nook or a print. Once I get into it, she says, I don't care. I, I don't know where I am. So. Yes. <laughs> First, I want to mention, um, I thought your film was wonderful. Thank you. It brought up some really very catalytic ideas to think about. Um, Amazon has really become very powerful. And uh, what really resonated in the one comment, somebody said that uh, they're ruthless. They've gone after Barnes and Noble, and you know they blocked Barnes and Noble from having their books, and they have all these imprints now. Can you comment in? because you've done, obviously, a lot of research and you've talked to a lot of people. This is a very corporate society that we live in. And, you know, all you have to do is look at the Super Bowl, the influence that that has. And if you look at how companies market, but link market their products to push their particular products, what effect will a major corporation like Amazon have long term in terms of the spectrum of materials that's really offered that really represents a diversity of a civilization? I mean, that's basically, the, I know that's a huge question. It is a huge question, and I think I'll go back to what can we do. It is amazing to me how quickly we've relinquished our our ability to influence society. <laughs> uh, we have a lot of our minds. We are, we are victims of this fast-moving society, even though I hate to use the word victims. We you know, this is what there is. We don't write letters. We don't I mean, you know, <coughs> schools are going digital, which is fine, fine. But at least we should, and al although I shouldn't have said that because 
there are some amazing efforts going on in the in the, uh, in education. Um, there's the Common Core curriculum that's really catching up. Uh, there is the inverse classes where they do their homework in school and they're given assignments at home. I mean, there's some really amazing things going on. You know, about <laughs> yeah, they they work, they don't work. We're still in transitional times, and you know, when we all say we want both, well, <laughs> one of the reasons I made the film this way is I really wanted to show the interconnection between all these subjects. You can't say, you can't have kids say, I want to read the printed book without doing something about it. Who's going to publish it? What is, I don't know what the new business model for a publishing company is if everybody, if there's a perception that everything is going digital, the books are going digital, the bookstores are closing, the libraries are turning into coffee shops. So this is one way of addressing you got to do something about it. You have to write. You have to be. Um, you have to. <laughs> even book lovers, they go to a bookstore, and they'll see something they like. They scan it. They go home and they go and order it from Amazon. So, you know, I've who would I've met the enemy, and it is I or something like that. I mean, you know, um, you had a question. I'm sorry. You had a question before. Yeah. You know, Dickens uh, published initially in serial form. Maybe ne we need to go right. back to that. Right, and right. And with the short attention span. Right. But uh, I, I would argue for Amazon, I, I think it's the opposite effect. They have made books too easy to acquire. <laughs> and, 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 and I don't know how many millions of, uh, of titles they have available now. And they are cheap. They're making them affordable for a lot more people. And, and they're so trying because now they're saying if you buy the printed, uh, the digital, you can buy the printed for a lower cost. I forgot exactly how much. So some of these things are slowly coming out. Yeah, and also they publish the singles for people who. I mean, my impression when I spoke to him is that he's a real book lover. He has a um, a book club at Amazon. Yes, Jeff Bezos and. But, you know, he could have tried to uh, have a, a cost model of his books similar to what Apple proposed, uh, but he just decided to take a loss, as he does with a lot of his products initially, because he just wants to sell everything and wants to do everything. But and what we want to do is thank Vivian for making the trip here today. Oh, no. Thank you for coming. and. Really, thank you for coming, for participating. I really enjoyed being here. It's been a vigorous discussion, and we're so delighted you came to do it thank and the arduous so trip fun. that today's oh, weather meant crazy. to be able to come it and do it. It was just surrealistic. Every time we thought we were going forward, we you went didn't. backwards. <laughs> <laughs> I've been to New York recently, and, uh, and New York that I haven't So <laughs> delighted that somebody else experienced experience it rather than me. Um, this is also a group, all of you, by your discussion today who are sort of people of the word and people of the book. And the University Library has a book club. Um, table. And the reason we've put this together is a couple of years ago, the Library of Congress and their curators put together a list of books that shaped America. That's the title of that series. And they're not the prize winners necessarily. They're not the best books necessarily. But over time, we've argued about them. We've loved them. We've hated them. We've raised our children according to them. And we've cooked by them. So the joy of cooking is on there. And Dr. Spock is on there. And the master's book of sex is on there. But the next ones that we are going to be doing in our book club, which is always led by a faculty and has vigorous discussion. We have several people in the room who have attended all of them. On February 18th, we have The Fire Next Time by James Baldwin, led by Kyle Dargan, director of the Creative Writing Program here at the university. On April the 1st, we have Stranger in a Strange Land by Robert Heinlein, led by Patrick Jackson, the associate dean of SIS, the School of, of International Service. And then later in April, we have Atlas Shrugged by Anne Rand, which I have never made it my way through that book. <laughs> I'm the librarian here, and 
and I've never made my way through. And I actually am not so much a book reader as I am a book listener. People read to me every day while I do multiple things. Um, and I've still made, never made it through Atlas Shrug. But we will have um, Nia Mehta, an assistant professor of SPECS, the School of Professional Extended Studies, leading that discussion with us. We don't check you as you come in to see if you've read it. You're free to say, you know, 30 years ago when I read this book, and, and we have a lot of those kinds of discussions, so please pick up the flyer and please come back and, and have dessert, coffee, and share a book talk with us. Thank you for coming today.